Hello everyone, let's talk about HPC. My name, as you already know, is Sven, and I'm, I'm field CTO uh, at Vast Data. My, hmm? ah, okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, my career in HPC started uh, back in 2005 when I joined the Fraunhofer Center for High Performance Computing uh, in Germany. Uh, I stayed there for over a decade to create the BGFS parallel file system. Um, later became the CEO uh, of that company behind the file system, had a great time, had some detours. But then, uh, a bit more than a year ago, in early 2021, Vast Data asked me whether I would be interested in joining the rocket ship, and of course, I could not resist. So. That uh, luckily brought me today from Germany here to Korea. Uh, and I must say, I love Korea. You are all so friendly. And I had so great conversations here already. So I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the day and talking uh, to all of you. OK, so <laughs> this was basically HPC back in the days uh, when I started, right? A bunch of uh, nerds uh, sitting in the basement. I hope I didn't look exactly like this, but I was sure one of uh, these nerds, very flaky hardware that we somehow plucked uh, together and happy if anything ran at all across at least a couple uh, of compute nodes. This is also the time when many of the storage systems that we're still using today uh, were invented, right? There was no sign uh, of all flash, of course, right? So how would you design a system for all flash if you don't even know that it would appear uh, at some point? Um, and also multi-core architectures, right? GPU computing, nobody uh, saw that coming at that uh, time. But in general, nevertheless, of course, as some of you might know and some of you might not know, um, HPC has come a long way uh, in the last years, right? We're in the, industry, uh, in the IT industry. Everything develops so quickly. In the blink of an eye, right, if you uh, are not careful, then your competitors uh, might completely pass you by because you missed an important trend. HPC is sure not a trend uh, that Korea has missed. It is, uh, it is really uh, everywhere, as you certainly know, right? It stabilizes our financial markets. It's so important for our healthcare, as you already know uh, from Kartik. It's very entertaining if we use it for uh, great uh, movies, uh, for instance, and it even takes us uh, to different planets. And VAST is, of course, used uh, in all these industries. Um, but uh, classically, HPC has mostly been used for simulations. Uh, simulations means that we, as the humans, try to uh, understand certain properties or a certain problem, and then afterwards try to teach a computer um, how something changes when certain input uh, parameters change or, or uh, what the outcome would be generally right for given uh, properties. Turns out that uh, we as humans are of course very clever, right? We can learn things uh, if we spend enough time. Uh, but computers can in some sense be uh, much smarter than us, right? They can learn even better. So the new HPC is of course HPC for AI, right? Where instead of us trying to understand something first and then afterwards teaching a computer uh, how things work, the computer now learns itself how something works and can learn that much, much faster than we do. But computers learn different from humans, of course, in the sense that a child, for instance, you tell three or four times this is a dog, and then the child recognizes that something is a dog, right? That's very different for a computer. For a computer, you have to show it millions and millions of images of dogs from all sides and angles and different shapes and colors and so on. Then afterwards, it will perfectly recognize what a dog is, but not if you show it only three or four images, right? Then it will sure make the wrong decisions. And that's what suddenly turned the world into a very, very data-centric world, where it is so important that we have all the data available to train the computers. If we have all this data available and in fast access, then the computers can make very quick and uh, very intelligent decisions. If we don't have this data available in fast access, then a simple 
uh, consequence is that the resulting models are very poor. The computers will make very bad decisions and they will, they will make that in very critical situations like autonomous driving. So that's sure not a future uh, that we want to have. So that means, right, uh, compared to classic HPC, there was a bit of input. Many simulations were run over a long uh, time, very compute intensive, and the output was rather big, right? That was the result of all these uh, simulations. And that now changes uh, with the new HPC error, uh, as I call it, which is actually the AI, uh, machine learning and deep uh, learning error, where the input, the data, all the historic data that you have gathered is so important. Not only the recent data, there's no longer something like the active working set, right? All your data needs to be active and in fast access so that you can always learn from it again and again uh, with new versions of your uh, algorithms. So in some sense, of course, uh, HPC is the applications that we run that is clearly shifting to AI applications. On the other hand, HPC are also the frameworks that we need to run these applications uh, at scale. Okay, so as you already know now, your data is the essence of this uh, new era, right? Uh, and I would claim that vast data is the only storage system that has actually been purpose-built uh, for this new era, because when vast data was founded, all this uh, was easy to see uh, upcoming, so we could do the right things uh, to address uh, this new era. Uh, and what does that mean? for a storage system of this new era. Of course, on the one hand, such a storage system, you know that already now, has to give you fast access to all of your data. Spinning disks can, there's no way that spinning disks uh, can handle the speed at which the GPUs try to learn data, right? If you're bound by the spinning disk, then the training will take so uh, awfully long that it's just no longer feasible, so you don't even need to get started. Uh, the other thing is that uh, AI-based training uh, often is a complicated stack uh, of various tools, right? It's not only the single application that you run uh, on the data, it's a stack or a suite of different applications uh, that look at your data from all kinds of different angles. So that's why the seamless access from multiple protocols uh, to your data has now uh, become so important. And the third thing is, uh, you would probably say that for any storage system, but I see across many of our customers that they made sacrifices here, uh, is that your storage should, of course, always be available, right? If AI and HPC is an essential part uh, of your business, then not being able to access your data just means that your business stands still, and we sure don't want uh, your business to stand still. Uh, and the fourth uh, thing, uh, Kartik indicated that a bit, of course, uh, already is that these systems need to be absolutely easy to manage because we're building very, very big systems, right, to hold uh, dozens and hundreds of petabytes uh, of data. If they would be complicated to manage, it would just be impossible to do, right? So right from the start, we knew that these systems need to be super, super easy to manage, that we need to uh, provide the support, uh, the monitoring, and the easy configurability uh, to allow a single system administrator uh, with one day per quarter uh, to manage these systems. And that's what we have actually seen confirmed uh, by our customers. So we're very proud of that. Okay, um, the first three points that I mentioned, um, believe it or not, actually are a direct consequence uh, of how we built uh, our architecture. So this is the vast data architecture overview. You saw a more abstract version of this uh, in Cardex presentation. What we have at the top here, uh, these monitor symbols are basically compute nodes, your GPU servers, your Windows workstations, whatever should access the vast storage system in the end. So this is not uh, vast hardware. Uh, the vast architecture basically consists of these two layers here, the middle layer, uh, and the bottom layer. Let's start at the bottom layer. There we have the NVMe enclosure. This holds uh, 44 cheap QLC uh, flash drives and 12 storage class memory Intel uh, Optane drives in just two rack units. So that means 56 drives and only uh, two rack units, a very, very compact 
uh, design. The important thing here is that these NVMe enclosures don't run any file system logic themselves. Their only purpose is to make the actual stored data available via our special backend network to what I called here uh, the protocol servers. These are again uh, two rec units enclosures out of which you see four boxes coming out. That's because they are quad server enclosures. So each of them contains already four uh, independent servers. And uh, the very, very special uh, aspect of this architecture, and that's also what gave it the name, is uh, that all of these protocol servers, even if you build a 100 petabyte system or an exabyte system, each of these protocol servers is directly connected via our backend fabric to all of the drives that you have in the system. That's why we call the architecture disaggregated, because we disaggregated the data from the actual protocol servers that talk to the clients and shared everything, because all of the protocol servers uh, in this model have direct access to all of the data. And that's what enables the perfect scale out uh, of the vast architecture based on standard protocols without the need for any proprietary uh, parallel file system. Because in this system now, uh, any client can just talk to any server, and all of the servers have direct access to all of the data. So any uh, random server that the client hits can directly reply to the request because it has actual access uh, to all of the data. And that makes the, the large scale out of these systems so simple because there's basically no bottleneck, right? And of course, we have automatic uh, mechanisms to, uh, to distribute uh, different clients to different servers so that the node is nicely distributed uh, even in uh, large systems. But it also uh, enabled us to add something completely revolutionary uh, to NFS as a standard protocol, which we call NFS uh, multipathing. So a classic limitation of NFS and maybe also one of the reasons uh, why many people tried NFS and HPC and have miserably failed so far before uh, there was VAST, uh, is that NFS is basically just a point-to-point -point connection. So a single client can only talk uh, to a single server. That's in a, in a system like VAST, right, where this is a very powerful uh, data server that has access to so many NVMe drives. That's not bad. Um, but in the new AI world, where we have these very powerful uh, GPU servers, uh, that's often no longer good enough. There you really want that the single uh, GPU server can talk to multiple uh, protocol servers in parallel to have the aggregate performance and the aggregate bandwidth uh, of all of these. And that's the new concept uh, that we added to NFS, which we call NFS multipathing. So uh, with the vast NFS multipathing enhancement, now a single client can really establish connections to multiple servers in parallel, like you previously only knew it from parallel file systems, and then send out different requests really in parallel uh, to these different servers. And from the uh, client point of view, that's super simple. The client is not even aware that it's talking uh, to different servers because from the client point of view, all the servers look exactly the same because they all provide direct access uh, to the full uh, namespace in this uh, new day's architecture. Uh, so that's the uh, performance thing, right? The first thing that I said uh, is important here on the previous slide um, for uh, the modern storage systems. The second one is the seamless access. Seamless access for me especially means that you are very flexible with respect to the protocols for how you access uh, such a storage system. We already discussed that it certainly would be inconvenient to have something like a parallel file system client uh, that would need to be running uh, on your compute nodes. But uh, these days, um, access from Windows, for instance, uh, has also become uh, very important, right? Because these are the workstations that some of your data scientists are used to or where they do uh, the visu visualization of end results and things like that. So uh, in that sense, uh, VAST data is a multi-protocol system. You can access uh, everything from NFS for the Linux world, everything uh, through SMB from the Windows world. And now comes the very special thing, also via S3 as a cloud-native uh, object storage protocol. And historically, um, there were systems that support file and object uh, at the same time. That's not new. But the new thing is that for us, these are really just different protocols to access the same data. So historically, when you stored something uh, in a system, uh, 
uh, via S3 as an object, then there was no way to afterwards access that same thing via NFS and treat it as a file. And that's the limitation that VAST has now also uh, removed for us. There is no separation between file and object uh, anymore. There's just the data and file and object are just different protocols to access the same data. So it's no problem at all, uh, for instance, to have something coming from your uh, edge data center uh, via S3 written into a VAST system, and then afterwards you decide that you do the local processing of the same data uh, via NFS, for instance, or vice versa, of course, as well. And that brings us to the third one, which was the resilience, right? Your system, of course, has to be uh, always available. And I say, of course, but um, I know from our uh, customers that our competitors are doing a very bad uh, job with that. So what did we do to make sure that your data is really, really always uh, available? Again, uh, this is a direct uh, consequence of how we build uh, the architecture. So you already know that in a VAST system, the protocol servers are all connected to all of the data in the background. So that means from the client point of view, they all exactly uh, look the same. That also means from a client point of view, the client does not really care if some of these servers uh, just go away. It will just reconnect to any of the remaining servers and then everything continues as if nothing had happened because you have not really lost anything, right? You lost a bit of CPU power that was uh, in these servers, but otherwise none of the data was lost. All of the data is stored uh, in this level. So all we need to do for this is move the IP address to any of the remaining servers. Uh, the clients will just reconnect and everything uh, continues. Uh, we can take that so far that in a system of 1,000 uh, protocol uh, servers, 999, so all but one uh, can fail, and the remaining single one will still provide full access to all of your data through all of the protocols uh, that we support. So that's exceptional uh, resilience. Uh, Back-end fabric, I'll not go into the details, but also fully redundant, multiple switches here, uh, any one of them can fail, uh, no problem at all. Uh, which brings us to the bottom layer here where your actual data is, the NVMe enclosure. Uh, to get to very exceptional uh, resilience here, what we did and what you can't see in the picture is that these NVMe enclosures actually contain two servers uh, each, and the drives are physically shared between these two servers. So that means if one of the servers fails, the other one just takes over all of the drives and again continues serving your data as if nothing uh, had happened. Uh, which brings us to the last case, what happens if a drive actually fails? Uh, for that also we uh, decided to go with a very high level uh, of protection. We do, even if you have only a single enclosure, we do what uh, we call plus four erasure coding. So that means even in a single enclosure, any four drives can fail at the same time. Way higher protection than classic storage systems that use grade six, for instance. Any four drives can fail at the same time and all your data is still available, right? So your business is still uh, up and running. That means for us also, if only one of the drives ever fails, it's not even a critical uh, situation, right? We, of course, don't expect anyone to run into the data center over the weekend just to replace the physical drive. So we, we start rebuilding uh, the information from that drive immediately before uh, it was physically replaced. But we say, it's kind of a still relaxed uh, situation in the sense that we don't need to go full steam on the rebuild if we only lost uh, one drive. So we intentionally throttle the rebuild speed uh, of the drives. And why uh, do we do that? We do that so that your application, right, your crit uh, critical business logic and your AI on which uh, all your business is built does not notice any performance impact if a drive failed, right? If we would go full steam in the enclosure and say everything now focuses on rebuilding the data because it's a super critical situation, then of course there would be a big slowdown at this level, right? Things that you expected to finish overnight typically suddenly do no longer finish overnight because the system is busy uh, rebuilding the data. That's why it's so important that we have this extra high resilience also at the drive level where we can afford uh, to not go full steam on a rebuild. Okay. Um, 
Now we're looking at some uh, of the uh, examples for what I just said. Uh, we are, of course, very proud of our uh, great partnership uh, with Intel for the great Optane drives uh, and with Solidime, who make the very affordable uh, QLC flash drives for our architecture. But besides that, we also have a very important partnership uh, with uh, NVIDIA. They are actually one of the investors uh, in the company as well. And as you probably know, they build GPUs that are quite suitable uh, for AI <laughs> these days. Um, and they build these very fat clients that are called DGX A100 servers. Each of them basically contains eight uh, GPUs, and for these eight GPUs, also eight network cards. Right? Each of the GPUs in the server basically has its own 200 gigabit uh, network card. Uh, that means such a system can theoretically consume 160 gigabytes per second of data. And we have really proven, thanks to the new VAST architecture with the NFS multipathing enhancement and thanks to the GPU direct storage support that we developed for NFS, which means your data can flow directly from the network card uh, into the GPU memory where it belongs. Uh, we have proven that we can really get out of a single NFS mount point on such a super powerful client the full 160 gigabytes per second. So we're fully saturating eight 200 gigabit uh, network cards. This is just unimaginable uh, with any legacy uh, NFS-based system where you were happy if you would have gotten two gigabytes per second um, out of such a powerful client. So that just confirms that NFS with VAST is unlike any NFS that you have ever seen before. Ha, <laughs> yeah. This is a copy of a slide that uh, Jensen, the NVIDIA CEO, actually had in his last uh, GTC keynote presentation. And again, we're very proud of that because uh, he mentioned vast data in his uh, presentation for a use case that was uh, improved 10 times thanks to vast data technology and ultimately uh, allowed to crunch 200 50 terabytes of data uh, in only half an hour. And I thought you might find it interesting uh, what the use case uh, behind this is. It's the 5G use case. You probably all have 5G already uh, here in Korea because you're, I know you're very advanced uh, with that and you know uh, that interesting things become possible if we can um, transfer data so quickly uh, over wireless networks. The use case here is what's called a volumetric uh, video. It basically means that if we have a scene like in a stadium, but it can also be a bunch of drones, any scene that is filmed from multiple cameras from multiple angles can, with the help of AI, be transformed into a real 3D model of the scene. And why uh, would we do that? Because if we have a 3D model of the scene, then afterwards we can flip and rotate the scene and move the viewer within the scene to angles where there actually was no camera, right? That becomes possible when it's a virtual 3D model. Suddenly you can view your favorite sports game directly from the field uh, on your phone if you wanted to, where of course there is no camera on the field, right? But if it's a virtual 3D model rendered in real time, then you can be wherever you want, or in your uh, right next to your favorite golf player. I heard golf is pretty uh, famous here in Korea as well. Um, good, so that's one of the uh, awesome use cases uh, which we are very proud of. Uh, the other one uh, that you already heard about is that we are kind of specialized in building really big systems simply because it's what our customers need. Uh, for the era of AI. So this would be an example of a 100 petabyte system uh, thanks to the advanced data reduction that we do on top, which uh, Jeff will uh, tell you more about. Uh, for most of our customers, this is a 200 or even 300 uh, petabyte actual uh, usable system. Why am I showing this to you? On the one hand, because it's pretty compact, right? Only eight racks make a 100 petabyte system. I'm sure you won't uh, find anyone else who can build a system dense like this. It would deliver a performance of multiple terabytes uh, per second. 
But the important part is that actually independent of the system size, due to the high performance that you get from a vast system and due to the perfect scale out that we built uh, into the architecture, you can always read the entire file system within just a few hours, right? Imagine how powerful that is having a 100 petabyte system that thanks to the perfect performance scale out that we have, can be digested in only four hours. So you can run your training uh, and your new analysis of all kinds of data in very short time. And that's true even if you build an exabyte system, right? Because the performance just scales linearly uh, with the capacity. So the size of the system does not matter. This statement is always true for any size of system. Yeah, so with that, amazing things become possible, and that's um, how we got to this quote uh, of one of our HPC uh, cloud service uh, provider customers. This is Duck down under Geophysics. They have data centers uh, all around uh, the globe, uh, headquartered in uh, Australia, uh, 15,000 uh, servers in this uh, example. Uh, so it's a multi-user environment, as you would expect for an HPC cloud service provider. And they also ran analysis uh, for their customers on the data. So they do not only provide the cloud, but also uh, the services around it. And that's how they got to say, fast data is not only changing the way we store the data, it's actually changing the relationship that we have with the data, right? Because new things become possible when you have that very fast access to all of your data. Okay, and of course, uh, better than uh, me telling you about this is if our customers themselves uh, tell you about this. So uh, this is one of our other uh, large customers, the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, one of the top five uh, supercomputing sites uh, in the world. Let's watch the video. Hi. I'm Felice Lightstone. I'm the group leader of Biochemical and Biophysical Systems in the Physical and Life Sciences Directorate at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. I'm Cameron Haar, working at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. My formal title is an, is an HPC Systems Engineer, leading a storage team of other systems administrators where we manage about 75 petabytes worth of, of high performance storage. As part of Lawrence Livermore's response to COVID-19, we put together a team of experts in high performance computing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence to really try to make therapeutics to fight the disease. In that effort, we use a method called molecular docking where we tried to fit small molecules into protein pockets and try to identify that they bind tightly. In doing so, we're looking at over a billion compounds to try to find those compounds that could move forward in the drug design process. In total, we're using five different supercomputers and VAS as the file system that connects all of that information together. We're transferring and creating billions of tiny files, so we really need a fast way to connect all that information together. Like Felice mentioned, for our high-performance computing systems, we need something that's very fast, has a lot of throughput, and is robust enough that we can really pound on it with our mini supercomputers. Having a file system like VAST allows us to share those files seamlessly, and that's the key to success. And then one of VAST's major values is data reduction algorithms like data deduplication, compression, but also a new data similarity reduction. And those combine to give us more uh, reduction on already compressed data, all of which helps us keep down our storage utilization. The novel use of different flash technologies along with the ease of NFS access is what made VAST work for our needs. We get high performance, a novel architecture with cool data reduction technology, and the ability to access it from almost anywhere without needing specialized software on the client side. So this, combined with its high availability, made VAST a worthwhile solution for us. Yeah, always makes me proud to see uh, our happy customers confirming that we apparently did a good uh, job. Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab is part of the uh, US uh, Department of Energy. Uh, in general, we have great relationships and uh, great customers uh, in all kinds of industries, right? So especially industry customers 
uh, also trust Vast with their uh, business right to keep everything uh, running. But we are of course also proud uh, that we have a lot of customers in the government space. So. Uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, you already heard about uh, uh, by the example of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, which uses us for healthcare, high energy, physics, and a lot of things which they are unfortunately not, talk, uh, not allowed to talk about. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense uses us for uh, cybersecurity, zero-day uh, threat prevention. Of course, also a lot of data that uh, needs to be quickly analyzed uh, there. Uh, the Air Force uses us uh, for AI-based image recognition. Uh, and the Veterans Administration, you already heard from my uh, colleague uh, Kartik, they are gathering millions and millions uh, of genomes uh, to assist uh, with the health care of the uh, veterans of the United States. So um, I already explained uh, what we have built into the architecture to make sure that a failure within the architecture cannot bring your system and with it your business uh, down, right? So that it always is up uh, and running. But there are cases where uh, it sometimes might seem unavoidable uh, to bring a system down. For instance, I heard from many of our competitors that upgrades of the system are quite disruptive, right? These days, software is always an important part of a storage system, and at some point, there will be new features uh, that you would like to have in your storage system. So you would, for sure, sooner or later, uh, would like to do an upgrade of your storage system. As a matter of fact, uh, at Vast, we're on a three-month release cycle, so every three months, our customers can expect from us that we release new features based on the feedback that we got from our customers, right? Things that you actually uh, asked us uh, to do and to add uh, to the system. And so seeing this coming, right, how critical VAST would be for the uh, modern infrastructures, it was of course an absolute given for us that upgrades to new versions may not be disruptive in any way uh, for the system. So here's just a random example uh, that I took from the call home data uh, that we have from our system. So our systems have an ability to report the health status back home to us so that, for instance, when a drive fails, we will notice before you even notice. And we make sure that you get a new component uh, before you even notice uh, that you had a problem with an old uh, component. And as part of this call home data, we also receive these performance uh, reports, and here's the point in time when this customer uh, made an upgrade to the system. And now you will hopefully uh, try to find out what the special thing about this point in time here is when you look at the graph, and the simple answer is there is nothing special. It's just a point in time like any other, because upgrades are really fully non-disruptive uh, from the system's point of view. Everything just continues to run, just afterwards you have uh, the great new features available that you actually asked for. Um, the other thing uh, where disruption previously seemed unavoidable is that after, let's say, three to five years, uh, you decided to grow your system, and then suddenly there's a new generation of hardware available that you, of course, want to use because you always want to use the latest and greatest. Uh, and maybe even the old hardware generation is no longer available because it was uh, end of life, right? It's now uh, three or five years ago. Turns out that most of the storage systems do not support uh, such a case, right? Mixing different generations of hardware uh, together in the same system so that automatically makes a future expansion of a system a very, very disruptive event because you cannot just add it to the system. You have to build a completely new system out of the new uh, hardware generation and then figure out a way to move all of your existing data, your hundreds of petabytes or exabytes, uh, over to a new storage system. So we said that's, of course, not an option at all. Uh, for vast data. That's why we uh, make a guarantee that we call the infinite storage life cycle, where we as a company guarantee to you that any future generation of hardware that we might be releasing, you are guaranteed to be able to plug together uh, with your existing hardware. 
So you will always have the benefit of being able to use the latest and greatest hardware at any point in time. If you do this over three or five years, just as a natural expansion of your uh, data platform, then you will of course also say, uh, the old hardware is still very valuable, right? It makes absolutely sense that I combine new and old hardware. Our software will, of course, understand that the new hardware is bigger and faster. It will use that a bit more so that the performance is nicely balanced across everything. Uh, and it's good. If you do this over a time frame of 10 years or more, then of course you will say, okay, the hardware from 10 years in the future will be so much faster and more economical uh, and bigger than the hardware from 10 years ago that it makes no longer sense to use old hardware and new hardware together in the same system. No problem. Uh, it's still fully non-disruptive in the sense that you can first plug the old and the new hardware together, your applications just continue to run, and then afterwards you consciously decide that you remove the old hardware from the system, but the applications did not notice anything except that afterwards your data uh, is on the new servers, but the migration was absolutely seamless. Everything uh, on the client side just continued to run, and so did your business, of course. Okay, uh, some final quotes uh, from our customers. Again, easy management. Uh, we already discussed, of course, there's a super simple uh, user interface as it should be uh, for a modern solution, right? That shows you the nice green lights when everything is up and running, sends you an email when something is not up and running, but again, our call home service will make sure that even uh, our human support gets in touch with you within the guaranteed 30 minutes of response time uh, that we have uh, for critical problems. Uh, so that is no longer a problem managing large systems. Uh, and the other thing is that there are, of course, still cases where you don't want, to think, uh, want, don't want to do things manually in a UI, even though it is super simple. There are cases where you want to automate something like assigning quotas, doing snapshots, things like that. For that, uh, vast data is fully API-driven. That means everything that you could do as a human uh, in the user interface here, you can also do automatically through the API. So uh, that's something that our customers also uh, like a lot, that you can automate everything uh, around a vast system, which is, of course, also important uh, for cloud services these days. OK, and with that, uh, I would say <laughs> welcome to the new era of HPC and AI. Uh, we're very proud to tackle this uh, together with you. In HPC, actually, uh, maybe you have heard this uh, kind of famous a statement that people say a supercomputer is a device for turning compute-bound problems into I.O.-bound problems. So at Vast Data, we started under the assumption that we need to build a system that allows you to turn uh, I.O.-bound problems back into compute-bound problems so that you can focus on the things that really matter, namely your data analytics and your AI uh, and your business. Okay, and that's it. Are there any questions that I can answer, maybe? Yeah. 네, 손을 들어주시면 마이크 전달해 드리겠습니다. 맨 앞쪽에 지금 남자분의 손. Ah, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Thank you. I'm head of Cloud Research Center in Samsung SDS. And I wonder, previous presentation, there is so much uh, components using best data, especially the domain is about healthcare. I'm, I'm focusing for AI and H HPC, and is there any so many other customers of using best data storage in for AI or HPC, or how about in Korea? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We have large-scale customers uh, all around uh, the globe. Um, we started the company actually in the United States. That's why many of the customer examples that I present uh, were from the United States. But when I joined about a bit more than a year ago, it was actually the point in time when the company decided that since we have so many happy HPC and AI customers in the United States, it's really the point in time to scale out the company uh, globally, right? So I came on board uh, to help 
uh, leading this effort of scaling the company globally, making the product that made so many US customers so happy available around the globe, including, as you know, of course, uh, Korea, where I'm very happy uh, to be. Jeff, is there anything you might want to add to that question? Yes, so we, we already have a few customers in Korea. Actually, we were kind of really fortunate to have a few customers join uh, as, as Vastronauts. We also call our customers Vastronauts. Before we even had any um, sales or support team in, in, uh, in Korea. So a, a few very ambitious and progressive customers uh, took the journey with us before we were even in country. I will say, uh, a few of them are here today, although um, I'm not authorized to identify them, but uh, maybe you'll meet them at the coffee bar. And, um, and, and Teha can talk a little bit more uh, about some of the customer engagements we have if, uh, if, if you'd like to. It's up to you. Yeah, so nobody that we can reference publicly just yet, I believe, but we do have a, a number of customers in country focused on things like semiconductor design, focused on things such as life science, focused on things such as AI and autonomy, and uh, we continue to, uh, to work with more customers so that we can grow our footprint here. And, and I'll talk some more about some of our customers uh, internationally in, in my session as well. Yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> Very good. Any other question, maybe? Ah, yeah. Hello, my name is Hyung Jin Kim. I am a partner leader of Samsung Electronics Innovation Center. Uh, actually, uh, you two guys' presentation was very impressive to me, and actually that Thank you. makes me wondering a lot of questions inside of me. And I will ask about the questions in later and personally. But uh, at this moment, I just want to ask you two questions. So one is, uh, in your Previous slide, you, the bus, uh, bus, bus uses uh, legacy NFS client. Then, how can you guys overcome the overhead from the uh, from the kernel Linux kernel uh, overhead? I mean, you mean if we use the legacy NFS client, that will make a lot of overhead in I/O uh, sequence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the second question is, do you guys have a plan to register your performance results on the IO500 for the supercomputing storage performance competition in, in Raider? Oh, two very good questions. OK, <laughs> I'll start with the first one, uh, namely our NFS uh, performance. And I understand that many, many people in HPC have indeed tried other NFS-based uh, solutions uh, previously and miserably failed just because the NFS implementations were not really uh, great, right? So uh, on the one hand, it's important to know that VAST data is a completely new implementation of the NFS server-side stack. This is all our own code. It's not based on anything that uh, previously existed. But it is, of course, fully compatible with the NFS standards, so you will use your normal Linux NFS client uh, to connect to the system. That's also uh, very important. Um, but the fact that many people in HPC previously failed uh, using NFS and saw bad performance somehow created this impression uh, <laughs> that NFS itself would be slow. But NFS is actually just a protocol specification that someone put in some document on the internet, an RFC standards document, right? This specification per se is neither fast nor slow. It contains a normal read data message to transfer data from a server to a client, and it contains a normal write data message to transfer data from a client to a server. That's the same for all network file systems, for SMB, for parallel file systems, you name it, just a simple message to transfer the data, right? So this message is not fast or slow. It always depends on how you implement uh, the service uh, behind it. So, uh, but there were recent advancements also in the standards uh, NFS uh, Linux client. Uh, one of them was the support for RDMA. That, of course, helped a lot to increase the throughput and uh, reduce the latency that you have per transferred message. 
uh, over the network. So VAST data supports RDMA and support for RDMA is also an important basis for the GPU direct storage support because RDMA is required to transfer the data directly from the network card uh, into the GPU memory. That helped a lot. Another feature uh, that was recently added to the standards NFS client is called nConnect. So previously, uh, the NFS client could only have a single message in flight in the sense that right, when you send a write data message or a read data message, only that message is in flight and you have to wait for it to complete because, before the next message uh, can be sent. nConnect changes this in the sense that the client is now able to uh, establish multiple connections in parallel. The standards NFS client in the Linux kernel is uh, able to establish multiple connections to have uh, parallelism for these requests, right? The problem with this uh, feature in the standard Linux kernel is that all these connections still go only to the same server because you can only provide a single server IP address. So even if you have eight or 10 connections, all of them are between uh, the, same, the same servers. So that's the thing uh, that vast data changes with the multipathing. There we just simply, based on this nConnect feature, add an option uh, to allow you to specify, instead of only a single server IP address, a range of server IP addresses. And then all these nConnect connections will go to all the different servers. And for that is also, again, so important that we have this special vast architecture where the client is not even aware that it's now talking to different servers because the client is not prepared to be talking to different servers. So it's important that in a vast system, all the servers look exactly the same, like the client would only be talking to a single uh, server, even though it's actually talking uh, to multiple servers. Did you want to add some? Oh yeah, IO500 is the other uh, important one. Yeah, I hear that a lot um, and I understand that people are interested in running this just because you have some reference results there, but if you look under the hood of what IO500 does, then the benchmarks are actually not really of practical relevance, right? It creates, for instance, millions of empty files. And I don't know any real application that is bound by the performance of creating empty files because usually we'll, you will always have content in the files, right? Why did people encourage the IO500 uh, to do that? Yeah, because the performance uh, of these systems sucks uh, when you actually store anything else than empty files, namely files that actually have a content. So um, yeah, our customers uh, run uh, IO500 uh, on VAST. Of course, you can uh, just do that and it works. It's not something that I encourage anyone to do because I don't find the results meaningful, uh, especially the end result, bringing everything, all the aspects of a storage system down to a single number seems kind of absurd, uh, to be honest to me. So. Uh, I would encourage everyone to run benchmarks that are actually meaningful for the business, right? And if you don't have a good idea, then you could, for instance, run a sweep where you say, I create files of different sizes, starting with 4K, 32K, 1 Mac, 4 Mac, and so on. And then I get a nice resulting graph where I can also easily uh, extrapolate how the system would behave with different sizes in between. So I have a very good overview of the performance of a storage system because I did the right uh, benchmark to uh, extrapolate numbers from this. So this is another thing that IO500 just doesn't do. When it uh, measures the IOPS performance, it does uh, 47 kilobyte sized IOPS into a single shared file. And there's just no application uh, of practical relevance that does exactly 47K uh, IOPS into files, right? Oh yeah, the one that inspired this, yeah, there's one application, I should correct myself, <laughs> that does this as the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, that's uh, how they got inspired to do this, but no other application does exactly four to seven kilobyte files, right? And from this result, you have no idea how the storage system would behave for 64 kilobytes or 128 kilobytes because it's just this number. And of course, the vendors that uh, give something about the IO500 list will try to optimize their configuration exactly for this size only to uh, shine in IO500, but again, uh, for me, that's not really of practical relevance. But thanks, that was uh, certainly also frequently asked questions, so I'm uh, glad you asked it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we are a bit over time, so uh, do we have time for any more questions or should we continue? 
Okay, then I hand over to the next speaker. Thank you so much.